Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Hendricks from McGill University, who is going to be talking about integrating action and perception in a small nervous system. Michael. Uh, thanks for coming, and, and I want to thank Stephen and the organizers for inviting me to this uh, fascinating uh, conference. I, I think I'm a little bit at one end of the spectrum in this conference, and perhaps a little bit out of my depth. Uh, to illustrate uh, how far out of my depth, sorry, is that okay? Uh, this is sort of uh, uh, this is a human brain, so a mammalian brain, a vertebrate brain, very complex structure with with hundreds of billions of neurons. Um, and this produces the thing we're kind of interested in at this uh, conference, like higher cognitive processes, uh, sentience, consciousness, uh, self-awareness. Um, this is the organism I study down here in the corner, uh, approximately to scale. Uh, it doesn't really have all the same bells and whistles that a, that a human or mammalian brain has. Uh, it's, it's a one millimeter long nematode uh, that's been really well described and well studied. It's probably the best described animal there is at the level of, of cells and genes, developmental processes, and the nervous system. So uh, it's really been a workhorse for doing genetics, cell biology, particularly in the context of organogenesis, cell fate specification, and things like that. And part of the reason it was chosen and part of the reason it's been so successful as a model organism is that each of these animals is uh, essentially an identical copy of the others. So within a given strain, um, these animals are self-fertilizing. They give rise to clonal progeny. So you have large numbers of genetically identical uh, animals. And it turns out anatomically identical too. So C. elegans has an invariant cell lineage during uh, development, and it has an essentially invariant nervous system. So of the thousand or so somatic cells, 302 of them are neurons. They're always the same cells derived from the same cell lineage. They're always in the same position. They're identifiable by their position, anatomy, gene expression patterns, and they're always uh, wired up in the same way to each other. So we have a very stable, uh, reproducible system to work in. And it makes us feel confident that we find gross behavioral differences or defects or changes in animals that we can ascribe those to uh, environmental or genetic manipulations that we've done rather than to sort of just individual variation because we think there's very little individual variation at the sort of uh, anatomical and genetic levels. So uh, one of the coolest things about C. elegans from the point of view of, of a neuroscientist though is that uh, we had this, before neuroanatomy was changed to connectomics, uh, we had what was a, we called the wiring diagram, which was uh, painstakingly done in the early 1980s. Essentially, uh, thousands of EM sections of a, of a worm, multiple worms were taken, uh, printed on transparent acetate, and manually aligned. Uh, so the synaptic level resolution uh, of the entire brain of the animal was done. Every cell, its morphology, all its synaptic partners, including chemical synapses and gap junctions. And we produced uh, the first sort of total uh, connectome of an animal. Um, I say the royal we of the entire C. elegans community. <laughs> it's actually uh, John White and his colleagues. Uh, and you can draw it out in, in a number of different ways. This is kind of a messy network diagram where it shows all the sensory neurons, interneurons, motor neurons, and muscles. Um, but what we like to do is break this down into what we call smaller circuits. So we try to identify groups of neurons that are involved in maybe a particular type of behavioral response or, or responding to a specific stimulus. And it's this circuit level uh, where I think C. elegans has become a real sort of, of powerful system for talking about how the nervous system functions and even some of the more complex functions that we might not expect in an animal with so few uh, nerve cells. And so what I mean by the circuit level, I want to illustrate with a sort of analogy where if you just look at a brain, it's kind of like we're in an alien civilization looking at the earth from space, uh, trying to figure out how human civilization works. So we can see see it from space so we can see that it's inhabited. We can probably see some mega structures and some kinds of activity, but we can't learn much about how human civilization works. Um, what we have in neuroscience at the fMRI level, sort of looking at this uh, blood flow signals that uh, indicate energy expenditure in different parts of the brain is sort of a gross sort of what parts of the brain are most active at a given time. I sort of liken that to a satellite view where we can see what uh, 
tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or, or, or millions constituents are doing in an fMRI or people are doing at sort of the, the city or nation scale. Um, and the other tool we have in neuroscience is at the opposite end of the sort of detailed spectrum. It's, it's single cell electrophysiology. And this is like watching one person uh, go around at one place on Earth. You, you stick an electrode in and one of the hundreds of billions of neurons in the nervous system, you get an extremely high definition recording of, of what it's doing. Um, but you lose sort of the big picture of, of the networks it's embedded in and how it interacts with, with other uh, constituent parts of the nervous system. So between these two scales is the really interesting scale uh, where sort of uh, functional circuits emerge. And this is why we call it the circuit level. And this, uh, I'm just really starting to stretch the analogy, but here's like a map of a public transit system or, or flight routes uh, for longer range functional connectivity or paths that are most often taken by people, or here's the ancient sewer system. Uh, so we need all kinds of information about how neurons uh, influence each other at multiple anatomical scales and multiple uh, temporal scales. And this is really hard to do because it falls between the best tools we have, which are things like fMRI and things like uh, electrode recordings. So these technologies are coming along, but it's hard to do in the context of a big fatty tissue like the brain that's full of, of billions and billions of cells. So uh, nematodes and some other simpler model systems where we have this complete structure of the nervous system, we can identify neurons by their location and shape, offer us uh, a chance to look at how uh, neurons interact and behave sort of in real time with high resolution at this sort of quasi uh, intermediate level of the circuit. So that's the idea. Um, and at this conference, of course, uh, I'm way out of my depth talking about topics like consciousness and the mind and the self and sentience and all these properties of, of more sophisticated or, or larger nervous systems that we're interested in discussing at this meeting. Um, so what I want to do is, is reveal my own um, probably very poor understanding of what these terms mean uh, from the point of view of a biologist. I think biology doesn't really address any of these concepts. We don't have good biological definitions for any of them. Um, but also talk about how I think uh, the neurobiology of little animals teaches us how uh, nervous systems evolve to develop the kinds of self-representation systems that almost have to underlie these kinds of properties of, of complex nervous systems. So here are my, uh, my silly beliefs about these things. Um, I don't think consciousness is, is one thing. I think it's a, it's a suite of uh, related and, and some unrelated capacities of the brain. It's something the brain does, not a property it has. Uh, I think that these capacities uh, evolved as separate functions and now have some shared and overlapping functions, things like keeping track of time, uh, uh, attention, um, like segregating different sensory modalities and things like that. Uh, and I think this, this sort of sense we have, the only really way we're sure of, of consciousness and awareness is that we possess it. Um, this sort of idea we have of being this unitary Cartesian observer with this uninterrupted sort of narrative of our experience of the world is probably uh, not very accurate. It's probably an illusion uh, created by the fact that a conscious thing is trying to observe itself. Um, and that this is sort of the big piece that I'm going to try to sell today is that the elemental brain circuits that, that are underlying consciousness and are not really for consciousness, they're essential to all kinds of animal behavior. And they, and they consist of, of small scale and larger scale self-representation systems that all animals need in order to uh, effectively interact with their environment. So uh, that's kind of the premise I'm coming from. And now I'm going to get into a little more detail about what I mean by self-representation systems. Um, often, I'm guilty of this as anyone, and it's something we fall into, especially when we study simple behaviors in a simple animal. We have this kind of pachinko game uh, conception of uh, sensory motor responses. There's a stimulus. The brain is just kind of there waiting for a stimulus to happen. It goes through some whatever levels of, of processing and integration, and then the correct motor response is chosen, and, and we produce a behavioral output. I don't think anyone is, is this naive, but we tend to think in this way and draw in this way. And it goes back to, to again, this Cartesian conception of behavior. This is his illustration of a reflex where a limb is withdrawn from a painful stimulus. And there's this idea, especially in animals like nematodes, that really their behavior is just the sum total of a bunch of linear uh, reflexes. So simple sensory motor transformations that add up into sort of a net behavioral output. Um, and this idea is so powerful that, that 
we often see diagrams like this. I found this on the internet. Here's the, the guy, he sees a glass of water. A glass of water is the sensory input. Something called integration happens in this neuron that seems to have no function. And, and then a motor output is produced, which is flexing the bicep, which brings the glass to his mouth. So no one thinks this behavior is that simple, but this is a powerful illustration. There are lots of versions of it, actually. There's one with a bald guy, and there's one with a disembodied eyeball and a floating glass of water. Um, but we know it's not this simple, and we know this from studying these kind. Of, well, we know it conceptually because people thought it can't be this simple. We know that producing a motor output, like take the glass of water and drink from it, is actually very difficult and very complicated. If you've ever seen a robot try to do it, it's usually a disaster. And we know that if you uh, inhibit people's sensory nerves in their arm and then ask them to do even simple motor tasks with it, they're unable to. So performing motor tasks requires constant sensory feedback of what your limbs are doing. Um, and so it can't be that there's this linear pathway from, from uh, sensory input to motor output for even relatively simple behaviors. So uh, in the 1950s, um, uh, Sperry and, and Sherrington and Van Holst and a variety of people developed a variety of uh, mechanisms to explain how the, the mind or the brain anticipates uh, its own behavior. And these fall into a general category uh, called corollary discharge. And so I wanna talk briefly about that from a neuroethological standpoint. So when there's an intention to produce a behavior, and this could, doesn't mean a conscious intention, this could be something done automatically, like flicking your eyes around the room or your diaphragm moving to breathe, it, it creates a motor command. And when the, the motor command is executed, it produces all this sensory feedback from having done the behavior, right? So there's proprioception where you can sense your own body moving through stretch receptors. There might be vestibular feedback, so your inner ear telling you that you're moving in space. And, and then there's reafferents, which is a catch-all term for any sensory input that's a result of your own behavior, right? So if I move my head, my visual field changes. That's reafferents. Um, at the same time, almost any motor command or behavioral command produced by your nervous system produces sort of a copy uh, called a corollary discharge or sometimes literally called an efferents copy. Um, and this, this corollary discharge signal produces a, a forward model. It's a prediction of, of what's going to happen when I execute this behavior so you can prepare your sensory systems to interpret it correctly. So what happens is this feedback prediction can be compared to the actual feedback produced by, by the behavior. And by comparison, I, I don't mean some linear alignment. I mean, these two quantities, this feedback prediction and the actual sensory input can, be, can operate on each other in a number of different ways. And again, I think the field that has best studied this has been sort of uh, classical neuroethology, where they've looked for sort of uh, strange or extreme abilities that animals have and, 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 uh, and uh, study how they, how they happen. So this is a cricket singing. Um, crickets are able to filter out the sound of their own singing so they can still attend to uh, other sounds in their environment. And the way they do this is every time they chirp, there's a corollary discharge signal produced of that chirp. Uh, that goes to their auditory center and sort of adjusts the sensory gain to filter that chirp out, that self-sound out, so they can keep listening. Um, active sensing is sort of the classic realm for this kind of signal. Uh, an echolocation, the animal probes the environment with a vocalization. Uh, producing that vocalization, again, also produces a corollary discharge signal that allows the comparison between a predicted reafferent acoustic signal and the actual echoes, and those differences are allow, allow the bat or dolphin to compute sort of spatial features of its environment. And then uh, John Sakata yesterday talked about uh, songbird and song acquisition. Um, and in this case, corollary discharge is used in a template matching activity where the bird has an ideal song in mind. It's trying to match its song to that ideal song. And whenever it sends motor commands to its syrinx to produce the song, information about that motor command is sent to higher song areas uh, so that the motor sequence that produced the song can be compared to the ideal song. So these are all different kinds of comparison that can be done, but they all rely on this fundamental uh, mechanism of comparing a feed-forward model uh, to, to the actual feedback experience. So in a sense, though, active sensing is one of the classic examples. There's a sense in which all sensing is active sensing, right? You're never really sensing things in a completely passive way. You're always interacting with your environment. And so even in, in mammals, uh, they're sort of getting into this uh, lately, I think, so when you do neuroethology in a mouse, it's called systems neuroscience. I don't know if you guys knew that. It's, they made up their own field for it. But a mouse uh, sniffing a piece of cheese here uh, has to breathe in order to sniff, right? So its diaphragm is moving up and down. 
And the motor command to move the diaphragm sends a corollary discharge signal to the olfactory bulb, and this modulates odor representations in the bulb so that you're paying more attention to odors as you breathe in and less attention as you breathe out, which makes sense, right? You're getting more information as you breathe in. Uh, there's something very similar that happens in whisking behavior, another oscillatory behavior where the whiskers protract and retract. And whether your whiskers are deflected when you're moving them forward or whether they're deflected when you're holding them still or retracting them is a different kind of mechanosensory input, right? One uh, might be a still object and the other is an object moving towards you. These are very important distinctions. And so the same kind of signal... Uh, in order to distinguish again between self-generated reafferents and exafferent input onto the whiskers. So this, this concept uh, generalizes really well to the point that when we look at sort of mesoscale imaging in the mouse brain, this is a recent um, paper from Ann Churchland's lab, but there's several others sort of coming to similar conclusions. They're looking at sort of, uh, it's kind of like fMRI for the mouse brain. They're really looking at calcium signals, but averaged over uh, hundreds of thousands of cells in each pixel. Um, they look here at, at representations of different kinds of sensory input, so visual and auditory uh, input. And then here are, is a lot of different activity in the cortex and other parts of the brain that for a long time people have characterized as spontaneous activity or noise. Um, in fact, what most of this activity is, is keeping track of what the animal's doing. So there's, there are signals associated with twitching the nose, with moving the whiskers, with grabbing something with the forepaw, with moving the hindpaw. And even in sensory cortex, all of these ongoing behaviors are being task that these mice happen to be doing. So if they look at the total variance in, in activity across the mouse's cortex, very little of it is task related, and almost all of it is devoted to just keeping track of what the animal's doing. So this stuff is not sp spontaneous in, in that sense, in the sense that it's noise, it's uh, actually the animal's own model of what it's doing uh, in multiple kinds of modalities and movements while it's performing this task. So I think it's easy to say, what we, one thing we know, correlated discharge helps predict the sensory consequences of your actions, and you can do all kinds of computations with that information. Um, but any stable and accurate representation of the world around you requires that you do this. So you have to be able to distinguish reafferents, uh, the consequences of your actions, from exafferents, stimuli that are unrelated to your own, your own behavior. And uh, the combination of reafferents proprioception and vestibular senses with kind of exafferents coming from outside is how we're able to create this sort of experience of being seamlessly integrated with the world. Our, our actions and our perceptions uh, don't confuse us. And when these systems break down, it's, it's fairly dramatic. So even a small timing difference or signal difference between your vestibular senses and your visual senses is completely debilitating. It's motion sickness. You might be lying flat on the ground, dizzy, and feeling nauseated because you're, what your vestibular system is saying, what your eyes are saying, is slightly different. So uh, back to this sort of linear sensor motor transformation model. In fact, what happens is we know that there's proprioceptive signals, corollary discharge from the motor system or at the inner neuron level. Uh, these are all processed in complex ways with uh, representations of real uh, feedback reference here as well as feed forward uh, model prediction signals. And these feedback at various uh, interneuron levels. They can even feed back to the sensory level, as in the case of the olfactory bulb. Um, and so there's no kind of sens uh, sensory motor pathway that isn't constantly sort of referring to itself and, ref and comparing what's happening in the world against what you're predicting will happen in the world. So these are uh, correlated discharge and efference copies. So there's this famous Dobzhansky quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I have a modified version that nothing in sensory biology makes sense except in the light of ongoing behavior. So the brain is never passively waiting for uh, sensory input. The, the brain is juggling everything you're doing. And even sensory area of the brains are constantly obsessed with what your body's doing. And a sensory input is actually just like being one of these jugglers being thrown one more pin that's got to integrate into its sort of ongoing activity. So the way biologists tend to try to understand things is, is by breaking them. 
uh, whether it's genes or different parts of the brain. We do lesion experiments. We shut them down optogenetically or with, or with pharmacological reagents. Um, and when we're talking about things like sentience and uh, consciousness and a sense of self and self-awareness, it's, it's hard to think of experimental ways we can break this in animals because we really don't know how to tell if animals have any of these properties. But there are some interesting things I want to speculate a little that humans do. Uh, one thing that's really popular is to go into sensory deprivation tanks, right? So sensory deprivation tanks remove all ex afferents. And the way people describe these things can be very interesting because they often talk about losing track of time, uh, losing a sense of sort of being an integrated whole or a sense of self. And you can dismiss them as sort of, uh, you know, new agey kind of things. But I think if we're going to take everyone's self-reporting about being consciousness seriously, we should take also seriously their self-reports as when that they feel like aspects of that consciousness are being altered or sort of uh, dissolving in different kinds of environments. And so I think an idea I have here is that somehow this sense of ourself is comes out of this process of comparing uh, our internal models, so, uh, so sort of our corollary discharge, the sum of all of them, uh, to ex-afferents, to the world around us. And I think that when you remove ex-afferents and you have a bunch of the brain trying to generate all these models and compare it to something and there's nothing to compare it to, you start to sort of dissolve uh, or eliminate this activity that produces this sort of sense of a coherent self of time, of sort of attention to various stimuli uh, that make up uh, our conscious experience. So uh, the other uh, major component or the other major uh, type of loss of, of conscious properties I want to talk about are schizophrenia. And this is interesting because we, a long time ago, schizophrenia was literally described as sort of a loss or a division from the self. Um, but then with sort of the rise of behaviorism and those ways of, of assessing psychiatric disorders, it became more like a checklist of positive and negative symptoms. Uh, but in the 1970s, Erwin Feinberg sort of had this idea of defining schizophrenia as a failure of corollary discharge at, at multiple scales in the brain, so at the cognitive level, but also at the sensory motor level. And this is because schizophrenia is a heterogeneous disorder, but two things that uh, seem to unite it. One is that people who suffer from schizophrenia very often describe it in terms of a loss of self uh, and a sense of, of, of non-existence or a division from their uh, body or their cognitive processes. So this, this distance, uh, loss of ipsaity, I think is the term. Um, and also you can explain a lot of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia in terms of corollary discharge. So I'm gonna give a couple examples of that. Um, one is auditory hallucination. So people, uh, suffering from schizophrenia often experience auditory hallucinations where they're receiving instructions or criticisms from, from what they experience as voices in their head. Um, and this is a classic experiment where uh, they had subjects repeat sort of common auditory hallucinatory phrases. In this case, it, one was get off your duff and do something. And subjects either listen to recordings of themselves say these phrases, or that's the playback condition, or they say the same phrase out loud. And while this was happening, they were undergoing EEG recordings, and these are recordings taken over an auditory part of the brain. During playback, there's this sharp uh, event-related potential that's present during playback, so listening to yourself say it, uh, and versus talking when you're actually producing the sound yourself, and there's this difference where that ERP is gone. Um, in patients with schizophrenia, that difference is gone. There's sort of this in-between state that is not like the playback state or the talking state. So the idea here is that there's reafferents, um, that's correctly identified as reafference when you're talking because of a corollary discharge signal in your brain that tells you, okay, I'm, I'm the one talking. Um, and during playback, you experience it solely as exafference. Uh, schizophrenics, if there's a defect in corollary discharge, uh, it, it creates this confusion where it's difficult or impossible to tell the difference between reafference and exafference. And this is proposed as a basis for um, auditory hallucinations and specifically voices. There have been similar experiments done with internal speech where you're thinking a phrase rather than saying it out loud. Is there a question? Someone raise it? No. I meant to say you can ask, interrupt me at any time as well. Uh, one other example about schizophrenia is this famous experiment by Susan Blakemore and colleagues where they have this tickle box where there's a little foam uh, probe that tickles the palm of someone's hand. And it, it can either be controlled by the subject or by the experimenter. 
And uh, normal control subjects report a, a lot of difference in how this feels. It's much more ticklish when the experimenter does it than when the subject does it. So you, you, can, you can't tickle yourself, right? Um, but an experimenter can tickle you by moving it. And in people with schizophrenia, but who are absent of symptoms at the time, are like normal control subjects. But people with schizophrenia who are experiencing symptoms, particularly positive symptoms at the time, uh, there's no difference. So they essentially are able to tickle themselves. And so both at the level of this high language processing, uh, reafferents, exafferents with listening to spoken language, um, and at what we think of as a much lower level sensory motor reflex level of tickling, uh, the shared feature here is a loss of self-monitoring through corollary discharge mechanisms. So um, I'm gonna get to worms in a second, um, but it, it suggests that there's something really interesting going on. If this is a unifying model of schizophrenia, why are corollary discharge circuits, even ones that are so far removed in function and anatomical location, so uniquely susceptible uh, to dysfunction in this disorder? So um, I'm not sure there's a good question, but I think the subjective ways in which people experience schizophrenic symptoms tell us that it is about uh, somehow the representation of self and these properties of the brain that give rise to subjective experience. So these are big questions, consciousness and mind. Um, one of my favorite quotes by the microbiologist Francois Jacob was said, looking at the history of science, we almost never make progress by trying to answer big questions. Um, what's life? Uh, what is light, uh, what is gravity. We, we make very little progress um, asking, trying to work these questions from the top down. In fact, most of the questions we've answered, we've answered bottom up by asking very simple questions. How does a bacteria use one kind of sugar instead of another? Uh, why did the apple uh, fall from the tree to the ground? Um, how does the worm crawl is hopefully for me. So only by asking these very specific, very uh, kind of outre, small scale questions. Do we build up enough information to approach being able to answer the big questions? This is my dad who studied rats. He put it a little more succinctly. He just told me once reductionism works. Um, and it does. It's not that the reductionism is the answer to everything or that it is sufficient to explain everything. But if you take a reductionist approach to uh, complex systems, you will get answers. And the ideas, eventually those answers will accumulate into something like uh, an, an answer to the big question. So that brings us to worms, which is kind of as reduced as you can get with a, with a behaving animal. Um, these are worms crawling around in an isotropic environment, so an environment where we haven't provided uh, any sensory stimulation. It doesn't mean they're unstimulated. There's obviously stuff around. Um, but we can observe their behavior and kind of look at what their crawling repertoire is. They tend to uh, spend a lot of time crawling forward. Uh, sometimes they crawl backwards like that one, and sometimes they turn. So, uh, and these sequences of reversals and turns often come together and we call them pirouettes because the animals will reverse and turn many times and they'll end up going in a different direction than they were going in before. And it turns out a lot of the animals' navigation strategies can be explained by uh, how often they turn in reverse. So the probability at a given moment that they'll engage in this behavior. Uh, if you give animals something they care about in the environment, so here there's a, point source of something that smells good to worms. It smells terrible to people, but uh, it's what we've got to work with. And it produces a gradient of this smell over the course of the plate. And here you can see the worms, instead of wandering aimlessly around, they're pretty good at, at uh, finding the peaks of this uh, smell in their environment. So this is sped way up. In real life, that took about 10 minutes. Um, but a lot of the strategy the worms use to get there uh, is, is very simple. They um, basically bias the probability at which they turn according to whether the environment is getting better or worse. So if you're crawling in the right direction, it's smelling better and better. The, the odor is getting stronger. The worms basically sense the derivative of that odor. And if that derivative is positive, they're much less likely to turn. They suppress turning. If that derivative is negative over time, which means things are smelling worse and worse, they become much more likely to turn and reorient, and one of those directions might be the right direction. So this is a strategy called a biased random walk, and it's actually exactly the same strategy bacteria use to chemotax. So I don't think you need any special brain stuff to, to execute this strategy. It's a really stupid strategy that works. It doesn't require any spatial sense of your environment. It just requires that you uh, detect the derivative of a stimulus and bias some kind of behavior in response to that. So that's easy. But there's a harder component of this too, which wasn't recognized for, for 
an embarrassingly long time by the worm community, but it's that they can also steer. So under some circumstances, the animal's crawling and it's lying on its side, and they actually lie on their side and swing back and forth in the dorsal ventral plane. Um, they can somehow detect that stimulus is different while they're crawling, and they can turn in the right direction and go up it. And that's a little bit harder um, for a reason that has to do with the worm's anatomy. Steering itself is easy. So there's a sequence, a, a series of thought experiments from the 1980s by Breitenberg. He called them a set of vehicles. He wanted to design dumb robots that could do complicated activities. So this is something that he started, uh, one of the simplest cases, a robot that either avoids light or goes toward light. And basically the robot has stereo sensors uh, photo sensors that are wired to wheels. And the more light the sensor gets, the faster it turns the wheel. Um, so if you wire it sort of ipsilaterally like this, you get a photophobic vehicle. This wheel will turn slightly faster, and this one will turn slightly slower, and the, and the vehicle will always turn away from light. By cross-wiring this vehicle, you get a phototactic vehicle. Um, and so you can, you can produce steering with simple reflexive sensory motor transformations, but worms can't do that, and that's because the sensory endings that worms use to detect stimuli are essentially in a point at the tip of their nose. They don't have a stereo sense. And so what worms have to be able to do, although we're not exactly sure how, I'm gonna tell you some ideas, is they have to be able to keep track of what their head is doing while they're smelling. They have to, they have to move their head and somehow integrate information about head position with what they're smelling and then convert that signal into a change in the behavior. So now suddenly the worms either need a very complex set of re reflexes, which is possible, or they need to have a representation somewhere in the nervous system of what their head is doing and their responses to a sensory input have to be uh, dependent on that, on that representation. So we're gonna get really into worm nitty gritty now. Uh, this is sort of where my lab's research come in, comes in is sort of trying to identify the circuit that can do this. And it starts in the animal's head. These are the muscles in the animal's head, squares, dorsal muscles and ventral muscles that control the swinging back and forth and the steering behavior. Uh, and the circles are all the motor neurons in the head that contribute to moving its head. Um, the ones that are primarily responsible for mediating steering we think are these two classes here. One is called the SMDs, or dorsal and ventral versions of the SMDs, and the other is the RMDs, uh, which I probably won't talk about that much today. Uh, what we found was this interneuron called RIA that unlike any other interneuron in the worm's nervous system receives a lot of synaptic input from these head motor neurons. So they're well positioned to sort of listen in, this neuron is well positioned to listen in on what these motor neurons are doing. Um, at the same time, RIA has tons of synaptic output to these two classes of head motor neuron. So it's also well positioned to change their activity and, and perhaps produce this steering behavior. Uh, and the third interesting thing about RIA is that it receives tons of convergent sensory input from virtually every sensory modality in the worm. Um, so again, this sort of a, a node that sort of integrates across smell, taste, pain, temperature uh, is very rare in the nervous system. And these are all types of stimuli that the worm can steer in response to. So it could, it, it's anatomically well positioned to have this role. So its anatomy gets a, a little more complicated here, but I'll, I'll go through it. So this is what RA looks like. It has a cell body that's this long unipolar axon that goes down into a ventral region of the brain and then through this structure called the nerve ring. It's, it's this donut shaped neuropill. It's the closest thing the worm has to a brain and it's located up here in its head. And most of the neurons in the animal send an axon or dendrite into this uh, nerve ring. Uh, it turns out that all of these sensory inputs um, upstream of RIA synapse onto this one region of the axon here called the loop. And all of the connections with the motor neurons I talked about, and here we're just showing the SMD ones, are in the nerve ring part of the axon. And there's a further segregation such that the connections from SMD on the dorsal side, which is SMDD, connect only on the dorsal side of the nerve ring to the RIA axon, axon and the ones from uh, the ventral motor neuron connect only to the ventral side of the RIA axon. Um, so this suggests how RIA might be listening to head movement if you spatially segregate these inputs. Maybe they have different functions. And the next step we took was to actually try to look at RIA activity in, in living worms. So this is a, a worm's head. And into RIA, we've put a fluorescent protein that is sensitive to calcium. So when there's a lot of calcium around, it gets brighter. Calcium is a, is a proxy for neural activity. It's not a 
perfect proxy, but it's a pretty good one. And when the, the neuron's less active, calcium goes down and it gets dimmer. Um, so this animal, I hope you can see, is moving its head up and down, which is dorsal and ventral in this movie. And as it moves its head up and down, uh, when it moves up dorsally, you can see it gets brighter here. And when it moves its head down, which is ventrally, you can see it gets brighter here. And these correspond to those two parts of the RA axon shown here, such that when, in, during a dorsal bend, when the SMD dorsal is active, you get a, a calcium transient on the, locally on the dorsal side of the axon, and this one ventrally. So at, at a gross level, RAA is at the level of these compartmentalized calcium events, topographically representing what the head's doing. Um, it doesn't do this perfectly, but it does it pretty well. Um, the other kind of encoding we found that RIA does is it responds to uh, sensory stimuli, especially it responds to the removal of attractive sensory stimuli. So we found that when you present an attractive odor uh, to the animal, uh, RIA seems to be hyperpolarized. It gets very dim, there's much less calcium in it. Uh, it's completely suppressed across all parts of the axon, including those ones uh, that encode uh, head movement. When you remove an attractant, you get a rapid uh, depolarization of RIA and the whole neuron becomes activated. So you um, kind of see it here. Here's how the animal's head is moving uh, and the odor is presented and then removed at the dotted line. And so these separate compartments are uh, corresponding to what the head's doing. So they're sort of decorrelated from each other. And then at the moment you remove the odor, you see this one event that occurs in all the compartments of the axon. So in, the, in this loop domain and in these two domains out in the nerve ring, you get this sort of synchronous uh, response across all of them. So that's kind of what the basic encoding properties of this neuron look like. Um, but the next thing we did was show that this neuron is actually involved in producing uh, this sort of ability to sense uh, stimuli asymmetrically across headbands. And so we put the animals in this microfluidic device that holds them at the middle of their body, but allows them to swing their head back and forth. And we apply different stimuli to the two sides of the head. So there's two streams flowing past the animal's head, and it can bend into either one of these stimulus streams. And a normal wild type animal will keep its head on the side with a good smelling odor. There's no odor on this side. And you can see when its nose encounters the interface between these two channels, it tends to bend back into the odor stream. But if you block RIA synaptic signaling using tetanus toxin, so RIA can no longer release any neurotransmitter, uh, you lose this ability. So you need RIA signaling in order to keep your head uh, oriented in response to an asymmetrically presented stimulus. So we think RIA is required for the detection and production of the behavior in response to asymmetrically uh, dependent stimuli, and it has to do with these two kind of uh, encoding properties it has. Um, so an easier way to display head bending is to think of it as a cycle. So we're mapping sort of the position and the velocity of the head movement here, and then swinging your head back and forth just becomes a cyclical behavior here. And I'll show you why that makes sense in a second. It allows us to look at how animals respond to odor removal uh, at different parts of the head bending cycle. So um, here, this is animal's head bent all the way ventrally. Here's where it's not bent, but it's moving dorsally bent all the way dorsally, moving and bending ventrally. So what we're looking at here is we're dividing up animals by where their head happened to be when we took away the sensory stimulus um, and triggered the depolarization of RIA. And so the dot is where their head happened to be when it happened, and the arrow is where their head was two seconds later. And you can see that when the head is bent, you produce these sort of rapid movements. So these are high velocity movements up here. They're not always high, but movement back in the other direction. And in the middle, you have less dramatic movements in response to sensory removal. Likewise, head bends in the other direction produce rapid withdrawal uh, toward the middle and sometimes overshooting into the other direction. And uh, withdrawal when the head's in the middle does not produce this. So we think that RA might be involved in triggering these withdrawals in response to uh, removal of the stimulus. And so we looked here, here are, here's an odor on where it doesn't really produce any difference in head velocity. Um, this is a control where we don't switch between odors and, and no odor, there's no difference. And then here's an odor off event. And we can see when the head is bent at an odor off event, it produces this dramatic high velocity head withdrawal movement. It doesn't produce any special movement when the head is not bent. So we think that uh, this is the process that RA is controlling by triggering a response to the stimulus removal only when the head is bent. Um, so we, we map this again, and in this case, we look at those uh, local calcium events that we think are mapping head movement. And so this is a, a, a nice way of seeing exactly how segregated uh, 
this asymmetric calcium signal in RIA is and how well it correlates with what the head's doing. So we think this is uh, a high fidelity map of what the head is doing. But when we look at the sensory responses in RIA, it's actually not a very good map at all. We don't see any correlation between sensory responses and head movement. But just like the mice, uh, we're assuming here that the only thing that RIA cares about is the stimulus we think it should care about, this odor we're adding and removing. In fact, this worm is trapped in a microfluidic device. It's squirming around. It's getting all kinds of mechanical feedback. It's encountering maybe fluctuations in temperature. So there's a lot of sensory activity um, or signals that might relate to other kinds of movements the worm's doing. It's trying to back up. It's trying to wriggle free um, that have nothing to do with the, the smell we're applying. So we had to sort of break this problem down a little bit more. Uh, sorry, if this is a more confusing way to plot it, but here we have head orientation plotted as a heat map. So in purple, we have ventral head bends. In orange, we have dorsal head bends and sort of grayer tones are where the head is not bent. And this each one is each animal over 40 seconds. So this is what its head's doing over time. Each row is an animal. And on this side, we have the what's going on with the loop calcium response. So this is the, the, the uh, sensory response to calcium. And here we can see the inhibition upon odor presentation and the excitation upon odor removal. And one thing we can see is that the excitation on, on odor removal actually only happens some of the time. Um, and that kind of bothered us for a while until we sort of sorted these signals by where the head was when the odor was removed. So now we're sorting all of these by head orientation and odor removal. Uh, again, these are the ones that were bent ventrally when the odor was removed. These were bent dorsally. These were less bent. And now we can see what's actually happening in RIA is, is it's ignoring the sensory stimulus when the head's not bent and it's responding to it when the, when the head is bent. And again, we think this is the core integration mechanism that allows it to decide when to respond and when not to respond to sensory input. So this is shown in another way. Dorsal bends, you have high uh, responses to the sensory removal minimal responses when it's not bent and high response when it's bent the other way. So our model here is this motor encoding and sensory encoding are happening at the same time um, and they're additive with each other and they're producing this change in behavior in a context dependent way according to the cycle of head bending. Um, and what this does is it allows the animal to gate its responses to sensory input by using this head representation uh, both as a way to tell when to attend to stimulus and to route it in the proper direction. So we think there's this gating mechanism where if the, if the gate is closed, the animal's head's not bent, it ignores the sensory input, um, and then the gate is open, allows the sensory input to, to be uh, detected by the RIA neuron. I should say we don't know really what the nature of this gate is, if it's uh, proprioceptive or related to some... Uh, corollary discharge signal we haven't found yet, but we think the second cor corollary discharge signal from the motor neurons is then used to activate selectively the synapses on one or the other side of the nerve ring to route this signal either to the dorsal side or to the ventral side. So we call this a gate and switch model. And we think actually this is, has interesting parallels to uh, what we see in the examples I gave you from the mouse where you have this cyclical sort of signal corollary discharge signal in here related to respiration or related to uh, the whisker protraction cycle. And it sends this cholinergic signal that modifies a sort of sensory representation. Um, this is pretty much, if, if you use your imagination, exactly what we see here. The animal is bending its head dorsally and ventrally um, and producing sort of this oscillatory signal that again modulates sensory representations that makes sure that the sensory stimulus is interpreted in the context of the animal's position and behavior in the world. And this is what allows it to respond appropriately. In the case of the worm, it's a very simple thing of turn in the right direction. So there are not great ways to tie this back to higher order cognitive processes. But what I want to suggest is that because even very simple behaviors in a very simple nervous system require using these kinds of self-representations and self-monitoring mechanisms, um, I think that we expect to always find them in every kind of behavior, whether it's a motor behavior or a representational behavior or sort of symbolic manipulation in the brain. Our brain is always producing copies, predictions, models of what's going to happen, and it has to do it in order to make sense of the world and to execute behaviors. And that's why as these accumulate and become more complex and more integrated, we can produce things where you have a complex enough entity where it's comparing internal models to the world that it becomes at some level uh, 
uh, something that we would call sentient or conscious, uh, even though I don't think there's a bright line dividing those two. It's not, is an animal conscious or not, or it's a, more like how conscious or sentient is it? Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to recognize uh, the people in my lab who, who do all this work um, and the funding agencies that support it. And I'm looking forward to discussing it more. Thank you. Much, Michael. Yeah. So should we sit now? Yeah, let's, let's, uh, Before we go into general questions from uh, the audience, I mean, let's talk about sentience. Right? Because what yeah, fascinates me that. about <laughs> nematodes, right, is that they're this great case of perhaps the simplest system that there could be that feels something. Mm -hmm. Maybe in that when you have reafferents, when you have corollary discharge, you have something that can be meaningfully talked about as a perspective on the world. You can say, well, the, the organism is representing itself, it's representing the world, it's representing itself as in the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm amazed by, by this, the idea that a, that a single neuron could underpin that. I think it's incredible. And it's making me more open than I was before the talk to the possibility of, <laughs> of nematodes feeling, right? Because my sort of prior view was that, I mean, a term I like to use is, is a sentience candidate. With, with no animal, there's no animal for which we can be completely sure that it's sentient, but we can talk meaningfully about what the candidates are, which things we think might feel. Mm -hmm. And my sort of prior view is that a sort of criterion for a sentience candidate is something that has neural mechanisms that integrate information from multiple sense modalities for the function of guiding whole organism behavior. And I thought when you have that, you have perspective on the world, you have the sort of thing that might feel. And I didn't think that nematodes would, would meet that criterion. And now it seems like actually they would. So these are, do you, these could be sentience candidates. Sure, and I guess uh, what I alluded to at the end is I, I have a hard time thinking of sentient or not, and I have an easier time thinking of more or less sentient. So of course, it, I, I entirely agree that yeah. lots of uh, lots of things, uh, what, lots of aspects of human feeling are gradable right, and come in degrees. Uh, experience can be more or less unified, more or less integrated over time, more or less fine-grained more or less sort of valenced. But I also think there is this uh, kind of minimal notion of does the organism feel anything at all? Like, is it like or not? something to be that organism? Yeah, yeah, at the bottom there's this, there's this bottoming out, this sort of cutoff. Is there anything it's like to be that organism or not? And it seems like nematodes are candidates for being on the, on the feeling side of that divide. Yeah. I think that's interesting. It, it makes me wonder, though, then, if we take sort of a materialist view, then is it also like the famous example is a thermostat, right? A thermostat has a has a model that it's trying to meet, and it and it has context dependent responses to trying to match yes. that model, and and it has, in a sense, a representation of of, of maybe not self in the way, but of, of a target, you know. So so it's easy to make something I think that is as complicated as a nematode with a fairly short piece of software in some ways, yeah. in other ways not. So I then have a hard time wrapping my mind around why we would more easily ascribe sentience to the nematode than to a couple hundred lines right. of code. And that's where I get stuck. And I think it's, it, there's no way I can think my way out of that. But that, I do think it's possible that it is like something to be an animal with a simpler nervous system. Um, but whether it's like very much, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah the, these comparisons between animal sentience and AI are always fascinating. And I never know which way to go with them, right? Because sometimes people make these comparisons to, to push us to think, well, of course, AI couldn't possibly be, be sentient. So, so if an AI can do what these animals are doing, the animals can't be sentient either. It's possible that we could go the other way as well, <laughs> yeah. right? And think maybe we should be more open to the possibility of sentient AI. Yeah. 
once we realize that uh, even very, very simple animals are capable of having a perspective on the world. Right. And, and one thing I think that gets sometimes conflated in the AI discussion is a AIs can do a lot of things that animals do with brains, but it's not clear they do it in the same way. And yeah. maybe there's something about the way it's done that produces mm. these properties we're interested in here. So I yeah. think someone had yeah, a that's right. question. Great. Let's uh, so go to the microphone uh, so that we can capture your question. I was just wondering if the, the, abil the, the ability to make a choice had to do with uh, sentience, like the, the, the thermostat could not make a choice about its behavior. Like, uh, can the worms make that choice? Like, given, like, if, if you put that stimuli, uh, can they decide not to go towards it? Or, yeah. So, so worm behavior is is probabilistic. So, even though they are genetically anatomically identical, as far as we can tell, uh, they do different things, and and we think it's because they. Well, we know it's because. Um, they cycle through different states on multiple time scales. And there's a really um, beautiful work by uh, a guy named Andrew Gordis in Corey Bargman's lab that sort of identified one of these state dependent mechanisms. And this is about when you take the smell away from an animal, uh, they usually back up. If something happens they don't like, they back up. But they don't always back up. They back up more or less frequently. And this is tied to a particular neuron that sort of injects a certain amount of noise into the system or less noise into the system. So um, one idea is this sort of like animals can't always do the same thing. If an animal becomes predictable, it's, it's dead, right? It's very easy to catch a predictable animal. And so the nervous system needs to either harness or produce sort of noise in a sense to, to leave this flexibility in behavior. So are they unpredictable just to other nematodes, or are they also unpredictable to, to humans? Yeah, they're objectively unpredictable. Yeah, there's a probability that they'll respond, and, and that probability is, is modulated by the activity of particular neurons. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I uh, Just a quick question. So the word sentience, um, it's in the title uh, of the uh, summer school, and it's also come up a lot. But it's actually not a word that I use very often. Um, and it seems to be sometimes exchanged here and there with um, consciousness, and other times with um, something like having a mind or being minded. Um, since it just came up with a response to these um, these worms, which seems like might, might might be like minimal cases of something minded, you might think maybe that's what this is evidence for. But then, like, say they're conscious, would be something way more robust. And I'm just wondering which way um, you guys understand the. the I, I don't understand those words. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I think they don't have biological definitions, right? And they, they come from, and so my feeling is 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 that they do describe something real, but it's something that I, I don't think is necessarily one thing or is, is one kind of thing even. But, yeah, I mean, sentience is an interesting case because it's uh, it's a concept with a long history, one that has been used in philosophy for a long time, and one that has come to take on quite a substantial amount of legal significance uh, in, in debates about animal law, where it's from the Latin for to feel. It just means the capacity to feel. And it's supposed to be, in a sense, intuitive. Um, philosophers sometimes use the term phenomenal consciousness right, to capture this sense that there is something it's like to be that thing. Uh, Thomas Nagel's example was the bat, you know. There's something it's like to be a bat echolocating, homing in on its prey. But from our perspective, we can't imagine what it's like to be that, that creature. But we can nevertheless accept that there is something it's like. Um, and the term phenomenal consciousness has become attached to that idea that you know, there's something it's like to be that thing. Um, but I think sentience is maybe a a more elegant term, um, and one that also captures the crucial link between phenomenal consciousness and our ordinary concept of feeling. You know, when when you're injured, it hurts. You know, you feel something. Uh, you you don't just react. There's something it's like to be in that state, and what what it's like to be in that state is to feel pain. Um, that's why I think sentience is is particularly good because it emphasizes the important connection to the ordinary notion of feeling, which is, I think, why, why uh, Stefan uses it a lot as well. Um, does that help? 
Uh, yeah, it does. I, the, the thought was a very simple one. It was just that it seems like in a sort of very rudimentary way, having a mind might be a really simple thing, something that might emerge in more simple creatures. And having sentience might seem like a more kind of fancy thing. That's right, absolutely. There's then room for a debate about is sentience, is feeling in there at the beginning? Right? Is it that anything that has cognitive capacities of any kind any sort of mentality also has some kind of minimal feeling? Uh, or is it that actually sentience is this much more lately evolved thing that is a kind of uh, icing on the cake where you already have a big cognitive cake already there? And that's a debate that, that will, will run and run. Uh, right, so... Just, uh, just a quick semiological remark. All these... I've come to call them weasel words because all they do is give you more and more phonemes without getting any deeper into understanding anything. You were talking yeah. about self-consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, access consciousness, uh, uh, qualia, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need all that stuff. And even Tom Nagel could have put it more yeah. directly if instead of saying, what is it like to be a bat? He's, he had said, what does it feel like to be a bat? Because that's what he meant. And that's what we're yeah. talking about. And sentience is yeah. just a Latinate form of feeling. Yeah. And, it, and it is supposed to be something that all of us know. It's not, we don't have yeah. to do a definition of it. If you don't know what it feels like to feel anything, that's right. yeah. you know, you're not, we're not talking the same language. That's right, yeah. It's a mistake to think it's the sort of concept for which we should be able to give a technical definition. Yeah. It, it, it's feeling, you know. We're meant to come to the science here with, with an intuitive grasp of what it is. And then we're trying to find ways of addressing the very difficult question about which other animals might have it too. Hi, thanks for the really fascinating talk. Um, some of your talk about action and perception were reminding me of some of the early roboticists like Rodney Brooks. I'm curious, considering how much we know about um, these name, is it nematodes? Yeah. Uh, uh, nervous systems. Um, has there any been, been any work, like Barbara Webb's work, with uh, mimicking cricket phonotaxis with robots? Has there been any attempts to create something like a artificial nematode? Or yeah, there's, there's a fantastic project called Openworm that, that's working on this. And basically, they're starting from the anatomical connectome. And I think one thing you encounter right away, and that I think is a lesson for the connectomics field in general, is that an, an anatomical connectome is, is very little information to go on to simulate an organism. You know, you have a you have a framework, you have the an anatomy, but unless you know a lot about the physiology of each of the constituent parts and, and what the synapses are doing, what neurotransmitters, what receptors are present, it's very hard to make a functional model. That said, they have made a model that is greatly simplified based on the C. elegans connectome and, and you can make it do things. One of the problems is what I alluded to with it does the same thing versus it does the thing in the same way, which is it's not that hard to make things that go forward and backwards in a sine wave, which is basically what a nematode does. So a lot of the space of models that kind of act like a nematode is huge, but the, the ones that actually do what the nematode does, which one is it we don't know. Yeah. Did you call that open worm? Please? Open worm, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, so let's have a question here from the... Did you have somebody there? Yeah, yeah, there's another question at the front here. Okay, fine. Um, I just want to keep the discussion going. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid you'll have to uh, find your way to the microphone. Well, um, this may be uh, a little bit simplistic, but based on my current understanding, um, I found it interesting when you said earlier that uh, the way I understood it is basically we, we could, you were saying on the left, sorry, I don't know your names. You were saying that, hey, maybe these worms satisfy the, are our candidates for, yeah. for uh, sentience. And then the counter argument would be, but we can build AI that does yeah. the same thing, right? But let's not forget that AI is simulated. And so th therefore fire, which is simulated, does not really burn. So. Perhaps if we actually build something which does all those things and which is kind of probably out of our grasp, I think, so far, 
uh, a worm like that, an artificial one that has all the, the same inputs and things like that. Well, then maybe we'd have an equivalent. Of course, we couldn't verify because of that other mine problem, <laughs> but um, we, we can't dismiss the first possibility because a simulation does the same, because a simulation is not real. So this is all I want to make sure we keep in mind. And this is actually from Steven, so this is not my idea. And I'm, I hope I said it right. But yeah, I read it from one of his papers. Oh, OK. So yeah, got that wrong. <laughs> I mean, one, one point that came across very clearly in the talk is that um, you may think with a nematode, oh, only 300 neurons, that's really easy to program. But the incredible complexity of the individual neurons, right. particularly this incredible RIA neuron. Yeah, this, is, this is a sort of nightmare. I, I, there's, there's good reason to think that maybe like cortical neurons in our brain are a little more generic, interchangeable mm -hmm. widgets, but we don't really know that. And the true extent of, of neural diversity and complexity yeah. isn't known. And I think in the worm, maybe having a, a multiplexing complex neuron like this is a function of having very few neurons. Mm. Uh, so we don't know, but I think it, it is cautionary right. at least. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that, I think it's a widespread mistake in philosophy to think of neurons as these incredibly simple things. Yeah. You have a lot of thought experiments that take the form of, oh, imagining, re imagine replacing your neurons one by one with silicon chips. Right. As if, you know, of course a chip could do whatever a neuron does. Right. But, um, I mean, not only is that potentially a big misunderstanding about human neurons, but there's also this fascinating prospect that the smaller the brain gets, the more work each individual neuron takes on. It's possible, yeah. The more it's versatility cool. there is at the neuronal level. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, question from over here. Yeah, the uh, the active sensing points were very interesting, and I, I'm curious to what extent all steering is contingent upon these um, neck movements, and whether the neck movement amplitude varies with signal intensity. So, you see active sensing animals that are hunting in bad signals will do wide oscillations of their sensory appendages, and when they have strong signals, they do small oscillations of the sensory appendages, does the nematode does, do the same thing? Yeah, so you can do this in two ways. One way is to uh, provide a stimulus sort of in phase with head movement, and that will produce steering in the predicted direction. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you can do, it was recently done in, in uh, my, my former advisor's lab, was they could uh, selectively inhibit synapses on one side of RIA or the other. Mm -hmm. And so if it can only output to one direction, uh, you end up turning in the opposite direction. So mm -hmm. you can sort of use the properties of that neuron to basically drive the animal and steer it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you were getting at? Pretty, pretty much. But, but I, I guess the, the experiment would be agars with different concentration gradients. And the prediction from the active sensing hypothesis is that you would see larger castings of the neck uh, with, if there, with if weaker gradients. If it were truly as active, like they're saying, like, yeah. Right. I, I'm that not would sure be a trace that's true. of active. So perception. you do need a gradient of a particular steepness for them to be able to do it. That's just at the sort of discrimination threshold of mm. the width of a sure. head bend. Yeah. Um, there are animals that do shallower or, or deeper bends, and we haven't looked at those. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yes, I want to go back to the sentient debate. Um, you define earlier the representation of self as a process to compare what is expected from the system to what the sensory inputs are. Uh, I found that definition very useful, actually. Uh, it, it's very uh, straightforward. Um, but there was a comment just added a little later, but what about the sense of choice? It, it would seem that this representation of self also would need, otherwise the thermostat would, yeah, would be sentient. But uh, the thermostat is not deciding what the temperature ought to be, what's the ideal, ideal temperature the human does, and the human is sentient and is making the decision. Would that pretty much round up the thing, making the worm uh, having a choice, or this biological imperative being so strong that it's like no choice, it's just sensory input and output. Do you think that would be a, a good way to put it? Um, 
Well, I, I maybe imagine this. I take like a, a, a bad resistor and put it in my thermostat, a resistor that fluctuates randomly. And then suddenly maybe it looks like the resistor, the thermostat has choice, right? Because sometimes it, it does, you know, so. <laughs> and, and with the worms, I, uh, yeah, there, there's an element where you can call what they're doing decision making and choice. Um, and I think that the right way to think about that is that each animal has accumulated experience that d determine what states it occupies, sort of, of its nervous system and how often it occupies them or transitions between them. And this informs how it responds to a stimulus. And, and all of these things add too, to it sort of, to the extent that it has a self model, like uh, influence the way it produces that self model. But I, th these ideas that, that are intuitive for us, uh, they kind of tend to break down when you're talking about something very simple, right? Yeah. Mm. Question from over here. So I'm still trying to make sense of the sentience word. Like, the, so from that the perspective <laughs> of feeling, like, so is it just like the ability to uh, notice and react to nociceptive stimulus, or do you have to give it meaning, uh, or like, do you, do you need like the uh, just a neuron or the limbic system as well to uh, to give it sense, like in your opinion? Well, I, th I think nociception and pain are, are separable, right? Uh, they're phenomenally separable for, for people. Um, and I think that uh, you could, so we, we wouldn't want to say the Breitenberg vehicle that turns away from light finds light painful, right? That wouldn't be a sensical way to describe it. So I think they are separable. Aversion is separable from pain, but um, I don't think that means that we can easily classify where feeling arises or not. I mean, one of the things I was, coming to and trying to get at when I was preparing this talk was that um, the kinds of things that do produce a sense of self, these internal models, are, are, intrinsic, are intrinsically a part of behavior. So I don't think, like I think the philosopher's zombie is impossible. You can't have a thing that behaves that complexly but doesn't have the kinds of internal models we have. I think you can only imagine it because we're ignorant about what it is, right? I can imagine planes that fly without wings. It doesn't mean uh, that they're possible. Um, and I think, what I was trying to say was even at this basal level, any amount of complex behavior requires these kinds of separate uh, representations. So as animal behavior gets more complicated, brain capacity goes up, you have to keep adding and compounding more and more kinds of representation on top. And that it's an intrinsic part of even simple behaviors. I don't know if I'm kind of getting at it. But. Well, then the question is about when, when the representation gives rise to feeling. Right. Um, but I wonder if you could say more about nociception here in nematodes, because that was the other troubling thing about the, the talk, right? You, if you think, hang on, these might be sentience candidates. They have a perspective on the world. They represent themselves, the world around them. Maybe they feel things. And then you realize that one of the things being integrated is, is nociceptive stimuli. It starts to make you wonder if they feel something that might be pain-like. Sure, they, they definitely have uh, nociceptive senses. They respond to uh, noxious chemicals, mechanical damage, you know, harsh stimuli um, through well-characterized pathways, some of which are physiologically related to uh, the ones in humans, like the TRP channels involved in sensing some of these things and uh, the shared mechanoreceptor, mechanosensory channels. Um, and they produce aversive responses. They're things the worms hate, you know, and you can... Um, easily describe it as nociception, I think, because it is responding to potentially damaging uh, insults. Uh, pain then becomes the hard part. Is there a threshold or is it just graded, sort of <laughs> the sort of ability to feel something out? Because it does require this emotional... Yeah, but we can talk about yeah. candidates. Right? We can we say they're candidates, not, not just for feeling something in this sort of sensory motor sense of, of, of having a, uh, a sort of perspective on the world, but also in the, in the kind of uh, valence sense of feeling some things to be aversive. Right. Um, I mean, do you think it's fair to say that given that nematodes have no susception, there shouldn't even really be a debate about whether complex animals like, like fish do? I mean, because there was for a, long, for a long time, even if we, we now think it's settled. People used to say, you know, fish don't 
don't have no cisectors, but that, if nematodes do, there, there shouldn't even really be a debate, should there? But yeah, I, I think it, no cisception is so has such obvious survival advantage. Imagining an animal that doesn't detect and avoid damaging stimuli is kind of mm. a non-starter. So it's, yeah. Uh, question from over here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, I have two questions. Um, I want a biologist opinion. So um, my first question is, um, do you think that uh, an organism needs to be alive to have a conscience? Or if it just had a, a system that treated information uh, like a robot, for example, would that be enough? And um, you mentioned something in your presentation. Uh, you said that a reductionism work. So um, from uh, what I understand is that um, you need a nervous system uh, to have a feeling, to have a conscious. Uh, there was a time where we believed that because um, consciousness was such a complex behavior that it was probably something that only human had. But then we realized that um, it's not it's not just about a brain. That's why we started including animals um, and uh, animals to be candidate for a conscious experience. So um, how how can we um, how far can we reduce conscious in your opinion? Uh, so the first part was about living, not living, and this kind of thing. So I mean, alive is another thing where I feel like there's no uh, bright line, right? So. Uh, are viruses alive? I, I don't really care. I, they're clearly somewhere in the in between. Um, but in terms of uh, whether something so you're saying something non-living like a machine or computer can be conscious or sentient, I don't see why not. Like I, I feel like uh, um, this is a property of a system that comes about from how it interacts, how its components interact with each other, and not something about cells and lipids and nucleic acids, right? So it should be substrate neutral in some sense. So I, I don't have a theoretical problem with that. I think there's a deep problem is would we ever know um, and how complicated would it have to be, which is the other question. And again, one where I don't have an answer, I feel like, um, I feel like animals can be conscious in a sense, but maybe less conscious than another animal. And you, can, and you can regress that all the way back until you decide to call it not conscious. And so, yeah, I mean, Various philosophers have suggested the potential deep connection between mind and life. I mean, Evan Thompson's book, Mind, uh, mind in Life, comes to mind particularly here, where the thought is something like, you know, there's all living things face these common challenges of maintaining themselves, organizing themselves, metabolism, and there's some sort of deep entanglement between metabolism and mind something to do with mind is about it's part of the process through which an organism maintains itself okay. and organizes itself um i don't know whether that's right or not but it's just it's an idea in you know in, in this area that's worth taking seriously that potentially leads to a kind of biopsychism where you think that there's some basic form of mentality there in all living things okay. well you get a crack at that when Reber comes to talk, yeah, because yeah. he's really saying it's there in, in prokaryotes, mm. it's in the, there in anything with a cell membrane. <clears throat> but I'm really glad that Mike is participating. I mean, you, you took the, the mission to be something else with all that stuff about schizophrenia and people. It's not that. We really did want to hear about nematodes. And it really was the questions that we're talking about now. And it was exactly what came up during the, during the question session that this is all about. But I want to give it a darker note because this is not just scientific curiosity driven. Let me see our thermostats, um, our thermostats sentient, do they feel, do, uh, does every cell feel, etc. It's not tossing around little notions like that. I think we've established at this summer school at least that uh, when it comes to mammals and, and birds, there's no doubt that they feel. Okay, very only only people who are in an industry that's profiting from hurting them uh, wants to deny that they feel. But 
I wanted to bring it down to levels where there really was uncertainty, mm -hmm. instead of this fake uncertainty that you invoke in order to ju justify what you're doing. There really is uncertainty. There's uncertainty in the case of nematodes. There's uncertainty in the case of plants. For some people, there's uncertainty at the level of low invertebrates as well. Um, um, Gordon, when he, was, when he was militating on behalf of reptiles and saying how people are biased against reptiles, showed a surreptitious bias against amphibians while he was talking, as if he was ready to grant feeling to reptiles, but not to amphib amphibians. But we're getting into areas where there really is room for doubt. And now I want to challenge some of your concepts that you're recommending over here. You're saying that the re reason the nematodes are maybe relevant to this, and it has even caught Jonathan's imagination, is this business about uh, expected state I mean, and, and the current state and comparator, and then you used another weasel word, which is uh, internal representations, as if, if something's represented internally, that means that it's felt. Well, of course, the same question rises for any so-called internal representation, whether it's in an organism or in a robot or whatever, is why should it be a felt representation rather than just a represented representation? That's the core issue that we're addressing. And when people come out and ask about choice, they're just projecting their um, very vivid personal feelings about what it feels like to lift your, your finger because you because you feel like lifting your finger. And they're saying that must be the criterial feature. But it can't be that either. We already know what the criterial feature is. Is it felt? Does it feel like something to be in a state? If it feels like the, something to be in that state, it's felt. Whether or not they're internal representations, whether it's alive or not alive, is, does it feel like something to be in that state? I'm not giving an answer here. I'm just pointing to the problem that we're facing. And the reason this problem matters is because if we make the wrong judgment, if we either judge that an entity doesn't feel when it does, or we grant that it feels, but you were on the verge of saying this, some feelings matter more than others, some, some, things, some things are more felt than others, and we're wrong, there are huge consequences. And philosophy of mind becomes a moral philosophy. Just mm -hmm. a comment. Should we, uh, do you want to reply to that? I mean, does it, does it worry you as you work on these nematodes? Uh, of course, they're exempt from all they're exempt from regulation. Any kind of regulation. You don't have to worry about legal box ticking. Does, no. it, does, it, worry, does it ever worry you how they respond? I don't know if it worries. It's impossible to work with animals or probably plants too without sort of doing some projecting, some anthropomorphizing to sort of uh, being on their side when they're doing a behavioral assay. Um, that said, uh, um, the, the nematodes you know, there's a lot of kind of outswing. They live, they have a three-day life cycle to start with. Uh, they tend to uh, die as fast as they're born in, in their natural setting and things like that. So there's a lot of ways um, to to sort of consider their lives less valuable, I think, in that sense. But um, to get back to the, the weasel word argument, you're right. I've, when we're talking about these internal representations and stuff, I'm try really trying to talk about necessary conditions more than saying that this is going to be enough to feel something because that's sort of a ineffable thing we can't we don't have a way of observing from the outside right we can't uh we can the precautionary principle says if it seems like it feels something maybe we should give it some credit and, and it does feel something and any animal that avoids certain things acts like it feels something right an animal that uh avoids a noxious stimulus or worms do this very interesting thing where th there's you can make a, a ring of something that is painful to them. It, it's lead, so lead they find extremely noxious and they'll avoid it. But if you if you put something on the other side of it that smells good enough, they'll like work up the nerve and they'll eventually cross the, the nociceptive stimulus boundary to get to something that smells good. And that tells you that it is trading off sort of this sense. It's hard to not project feeling onto that, right? You know, it's a, yeah, well, that's often taken to be a pretty good indicator Right, of something, something more than a kind of reflex, some sort of centralized processing of the noxious stimulus with other stimuli and other information about the animal's needs, it almost leads you to ask, well, what, what more in the way of behavioral evidence uh, do we want before we start worrying? Right, but it's also a behavior you could build out of 
linear reflexes. You know, you could just say mm. if the stimulus gets strong enough, it sort of like sort of washes out the other one. You know, it's, so it's yeah. But it, but it's uh, it's difficult. I mean, it's a. Uh, There further questions? Yep. Can I make a change in this meeting? When you went full up to the microphone, for my sake, you can't be marks to the students who heard it. Would you say your name? And you have a role. No, sure. <laughs> Thank you. This conversation is getting really interesting. My name is Mireille Goulet. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, these nematodes are uh, genetically identical because they self-fertilize. Uh, um, where does individuality fit with all that in terms of that simple of an organism? Yeah. It's a good question. So, um, so for C. elegans, there are different populations found around the world and they're genetically distinct from each other. But if you're sampling one, so they live in compost, they eat the bacteria that, that feed on compost. Um, when you find a population, usually you find they're all genetically identical. So they're all um, within a few generations of each other. Um, um, most of them are hermaphrodites, self-fertilizing, about one in a thousand. There's a male, um, which is a, in this species is a sort of chromosomal segregation accident. Um, so individual, individuality, right? So from some perspective, they're all one organism, right? They're all the same, uh, they're genetically equivalent. Um, the survival value is exactly the same for each one of your offspring, say. So I think there is an element to that where that gets back to this idea of variability in behavior. Some people have suggested that the reason there's noise or probabilistic features to their behavior is if you have genetically identical animals that all respond to something in the same way, they become very uh, susceptible to making the wrong choice. If you make the wrong choice and you go toward the wrong stimulus, uh, then you're all dead or you're all starving. Whereas if you hedge and there's some degree of noise or variability, even though you're genetically identical, you're basically uh, lowering your risk because maybe if most of them make the wrong choice, some of the offspring happen to make the right choice and they can reproduce. Um, so it's it's not this type of, of multi-individual selection is very unpopular in evolutionary biology, but I think uh, these animals are interesting cases where they're essentially copies of each other. Yeah. If you allow me, um, where would you draw the line between uh, a reflex and a decision, a choice? Boy, um, <laughs> so th it kind of depends on the animal. Like in a human, I think we, a reflex is something that doesn't involve your brain, right? There's a purely spinal processing. So we have this nice anatomical thing we can do. Uh, it's one of those things that is intuitive to us, but then I think in simple cases or cases that aren't organized like us um, get harder to make. So uh, I think a reflex is partly about reproducibility, how likely the animal is to respond to it in the same way. And I think something, I don't know what, about the degree of state dependence and processing that goes into it so even we, we can resist our reflexes quite easily by but we don't need our with our brain but we don't need our brain to enact the reflexes so with scallions i don't know i don't have a good answer yeah i mean the intuitive thought is that well if it's being processed centrally in some kind of integrative center then that's distinct from something that is entirely peripheral right. it seems as if the the story here is that it is being processed in in this central and integrative center right it, it's almost it's not quite big enough to have a real center and periphery like everything mm. is one kind of uh, but this ria neuron it seems like if anything can be called the center it's that it's it's one it's one of the most if, if just by inspection it's one of the most sort of central in terms of having the right anatomy to do a high integrative function i think right uh, yeah Sorry, could you go to a microphone or yeah. maybe if we just move this one. Thank you. Is the um, noise that you've mentioned proportional to the stress of the environment? Is it variable? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think there's a good answer, except I have some anecdotal answers that in some experiments, it looks like 
uh, inducing a stress response in the animal. So one easy way to do that is to make it a little hotter than they like. So they like it at 20 degrees, they don't like it at 25 degrees. If we do that, we know we return, turn on stress response pathways and their behavior actually gets less variable. Um, it's almost like part of the stress response is, is buffering uh, the pathways involved in some of the behavior. So in particular, chemotaxis, we've seen where if you have the temperature up a little higher, they become much more efficient at chemotaxis. So I don't know what to make of that. Okay. Does um, chemotaxis in bacteria have this same unpredictability? Yes, so uh, chemotaxis in bacteria is, is, as a strategy is, is exactly the same as what the nematodes do with the biased random walk where, um, so bacteria have flagella that can spin in two directions and when they're spinning in one direction, the bacteria move forward and when they're spinning in the other direction, the whole flagellum kind of, uh, they open up and the, and the bacteria does what's called a tumble and the tumble randomly reorients the bacteria. But the bacteria do the same thing. They integrate over time, and, and if the derivative is positive for the thing they're trying to get, the, the flagellum keeps spinning in the forward direction, and then they'll tumble with some frequency. So um, these are really, I think, a really cool example of the exact same strategy uh, implemented in completely different ways and on different scales. Question in the back. Hi, my name is Etienne. Um, what? Etienne, Richard, Dion, <laughs> Stefanos, Esteban, <laughs> Stephen, too. <clears throat> um, I got a question about the inhibitory process and the locomotion of your nematode. Uh, I don't know if they learn anything or they can really adapt their behavior to different environment, but I was wondering, did you notice a, a some kind of uh, negative priming effect or uh, inhibitory latency, inhibitory persistence in their uh, behavior. So um, there are lots of there's lots of plasticity in their behavior, um, some of which uh, people call learning and associative learning. Some of which is more habituation. I, I think some of the most interesting examples are uh, if you starve animals um, at a particular temperature or at a particular salt concentration is another popular one. They'll avoid that condition in the future. Or if you feed them at one, they'll, they'll be attracted to that uh, uh, condition. So I said they don't like 25 degrees, but if you feed them at 25 degrees for a while and then you put them in a temperature gradient, they'll go to 25 degrees. And they do this quite precisely. Um, that's, uh, that's all mediated at the sensory level. The sensory neuron uh, tunes to a particular set point that the animal then tries to match. There's an opt and that it's really, it actually happens in the sensory dendrite of the thermosensory neuron. It's really cool. Um, there's a more complex form of learning, which is to learn to avoid pathogenic food. And this is really complicated and not as well understood. It actually involves uh, RIA, that neuron, but in a, in a completely unrelated function. Um, there's tons of bacteria, C. elegans encounters that will kill it if it eats it. Um, uh, but some of them smell really good. Part of the reason they smell really good is because they attract nematodes that they can infect. Um, but if the animal eats this, gets an infection, has an inflammatory response, it somehow associates that with the smell of that particular species of bacteria and will avoid it for, for a while. Um, that's usually on the order of hours. But Amazingly, and I think an amazing analogy with more complex animals, is if they're babies and they encounter one of these pathogenic bacteria, they will remember it for the rest of their life. And you can clear the infection with antibiotics and then days later, so it's not a long time, but uh, when they're adults, they'll keep avoiding that uh, pathogenic bacteria. So it's almost like there's a critical period where they're setting uh, sort of rules about their environment and what they avoid and stuff. Okay, I think I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but feel free to carry on the discussion after the session. Uh, for now, let's, uh, there'll be the panel at four, yeah. For now, let's thank Michael for an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you.